Stanford University. Uh, my name is Norman Neymar. I'm in the History Department here and a member of the Europe Center, uh, Amir Reigns, and uh, the co-organizer of the conference. Now, but I forgot to mention that together with Steven Zipperstein, Norman Neymar is really a co-organizer and a central a central part in making this event possible in the first place. Uh, in, in the spirit of our first session, I take responsibility only for the good parts. <laughs> and the other parts uh, belong to other people. So anyway, I, it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, uh, session and, and uh, to introduce the speakers in this session. I'm not going to say much at all. Um, and the first speaker, uh, a colleague and a friend, uh, it's very nice to see you again. Is professor of sociology and women's studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, Fatma Mugil Gocek, uh, whose research focuses on the comparative analysis of history, politics, gender, collective violence. Uh, she's written uh, a great deal uh, on uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkey, and the problem, if you will, of the uh, Armenian genocide. Uh, most recently, a book that uh, we edited together uh, with a colleague at Michigan, Ron Sunni, called The Question of Genocide, Armenians and Turks at the End of the Ottoman Empire, uh, that came out in Oxford last uh, year. Uh, she's re recently finished a book manuscript entitled Deciphering Denial, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and Collective Violence Against the Armenians. She's written many articles and has really been a a sort of foundational scholar in the question of Turkish attitudes towards the Armenian genocide. So, move it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Norman, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for, for inviting me. This is amazing. And from the beginning, I got already very excited uh, with all the uh, discussions I'm sure we're going to have. Uh, and uh, my work also relates to this in a very uh, interesting way and I'm trained as a sociologist which of course will also puts another thing I have another spin on things and I have to mention that because when you look at uh, sort of the title you see 1789 to 2009 which usually makes historians totally pass out uh, given that I'm covering trying to cover 220 years I mean which is a very long time period. So I thought what I would do is uh, sort of start by giving you a sense of what I work on uh, and then I will uh, comment uh, on how that relates to our discussion today on history and memory. Um, my, uh, as Norman said, the uh, manuscript, the book manuscript I just uh, finished uh, is called Deciphering Denial. What I'm uh, interested in uh, is not whether uh, genocide occurred or not. Uh, I do not at all question that. Uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, it did, it certainly did. Uh, if you look at it um, uh, throughout history or uh, throughout time, uh, minorities comprised about 20% of the empire uh, before World War I. Uh, if you look in Turkey today, uh, the Armenian community is about uh, 60,000, uh, comprises about 60,000 people. Um, the uh, Greek community about 3,000, and the Jewish community about 30,000. And we're talking about 72 million is the total population. I mean, so you see a, a reduction from 20% to 0.002%, which, however well you look at it, is uh, genocidal in definition. Uh, so, uh, but what I'm very interested in uh, as an ethnic Turk, Turkish citizen, uh, in addition to an American one, uh, is uh, why is it, given this is the case, both Turkish state and society today deny what happened in their past? That was what I intended uh, to understand sociologically. And the way uh, I did it was that because there is such a big contention over what comprises historical sources, I mean, what are true sources and not, uh, most of the official Turkish narrative argues that all the Western sources are biased. Uh, the eyewitness accounts and survivor sources are also biased. 
as a consequence of that. And the Western, of course, scholars' uh, 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 analyses are biased. Um, I figured, uh, since I couldn't use oral histories, uh, because uh, uh, there is no freedom of expression in Turkey when it comes to doing uh, uh, academic research and uh, uh, propagating uh, ge genocide uh, acceptance publicly uh, is punishable uh, uh, from one and a half years to four and a half years uh, in prison, uh, basically. So that was out uh, as a concept. The other source that I could have used would have been literature. Uh, there has been recently uh, a lot of uh, translations of uh, minority literature into Turkish, but that has just been happening in the last decade or so, so there wasn't enough uh, uh, to uh, use. So I decided to go and uh, instead use memoirs, uh, contemporaneous memoirs, starting from the very beginning until 2009, which I had to stop at some point. And 1789 to 2009 covered a sort of a nice, clean, you know, 220 years. And I read uh, pretty much all memoirs that I could get my hands on uh, that were printed in Turkey, published in Turkish Latin script, and technically available uh, to Turkish society as such, so that there was this knowledge available, and why is it that they did not use that knowledge? Because one could, to a certain degree, understand why certain states, because of their political stand, take certain positions. But how do they get the society to go along with that position? I mean, that is what I was uh, interested in. And uh, I read probably about you know, four or 500 memoirs, out of which I used 297. Uh, mostly belonging to Muslim Turkish uh, officials, uh, explaining what happened. Uh, and this uh, is very interesting in terms of the discussion we're having, because on the one side, I mean, memoirs are interesting. Uh, on the one side, of course, they are based on experiences, uh, they are based on meaning creation. Uh, on, uh, but on the other side, they also give you a sense of, of history, history uh, told uh, through everyday practice in, in a way. I mean, you know, and how does one, of course, combine that with the other more scientific history that we as scholars and experts create? I mean, as a consequence, uh, that is uh, what I'm going to be doing, just to give you a preview of what is, well, I came up with uh, sort of some, <laughs> some very, uh, you know, uh, primitive, uh, I'm not very good with, the, with this computer thing, but uh, just to give you a sense, I mean, what I was interested in uh, and will be talking about is uh, sort of memory seems to be much more expansive, as people have said, than history. I mean, history, I think, in it has a certain publicity, I mean, as, I mean, on a public sphere presence in a way that memory does not. Um, and within the public sphere, there is, especially in the case of Turkey on the Ottoman Empire, sort of an official, unofficial, and what I call extra-official, and I'll explain what that is, aspects of it. And memoirs, I think, comp I mean, you know, these are ideal types on either side. They are, of course, not boxes. I couldn't, I didn't know how to make circles, that's why we ended up. <laughs> and if I had been able to do circles, they would have been like intersecting circles, and I couldn't get them to intersect either. But, but I just wanted to nevertheless, you know, capture the whole idea. In the private sphere, I think there is individual and communal memory, and then with time there is this other societal, or what people have referred to as collective memory, that emerges as well. But I wanted to just give you sort of the, the main parameters. And with respect to sort of what the knowledge created is in each case, I think censorship and education in the public sphere are very significant in the shape knowledge takes. And transmission from one generation to another and selectivity of knowledge is sort of the dynamics that I think shape memory. Um, so going back, uh, what I then did was I looked at um, uh, Ottoman and Turkish history to understand how uh, the denial occurred. And uh, what became significant for me is that, you know, since I was not 
only interested in the violence uh, that occurred in 1915 uh, to 1917. I said, how far back can one go uh, to see when this violence against minorities started? And uh, that's when I drew upon uh, mostly uh, Zygmunt Bauman and Hannah Arendt's uh, work uh, in uh, 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 analyzing, uh, and I Katz Nelson in analyzing the relationship between the Enlightenment, modernity, and collective violence. I mean, you know, and the polarization. And 1789 is my starting period, not because of the French Revolution, <laughs> although that also is a nice uh, touch there, but it's the um, year in, on, in which Selim III, Sultan Selim III, who, who started systematic <coughs> modernity in the Ottoman Empire, came to the throne. That's the beginning. And then uh, 2009, as I said, I did it because it was humanly uh, uh, you know, possible. But the way even, this I think demonstrates the way in, even uh, in which we pitch our research questions has contains in it certain inherent temporal and spatial assumptions. I mean, in my case, of course, by putting it this way, I'm sort of arguing that the collective violence was there from the beginning, 1789, and is still there to this day, which is a very different take than only identifying the collective violence against the Armenians as happening in 1915-17 period. No, I think it is a much more uh, continuous uh, process that starts earlier and uh, continues uh, to this day. That is, and, and spatially, of course, also, it sort of covers uh, uh, across time uh, both the empire and the republican periods, which is also a very interesting uh, comparison, of course, uh, uh, to take. And then I looked at four stages in that. The imperial period, the Young Turk period is the second period. Uh, 1907 is basically when Sultan Abdul Hamid II sort of ends. The second stage uh, is, oops, I wrote 1980. Well, it should be 1908 to 1918, obviously. Uh, you can't go backwards that way. It's the Young Turk uh, period. Uh, and it is a pro-national uh, uh, stage, proto-national stage. Then you have the early Republican period, 1919 to, 1918 is, of course, the end of World War I. 1919 is the beginning of the independence struggle in Turkey. 1974 is sort of, you know, the end of the first 50 years of the Republic, but it is also the year in which the Asala, or the Justice Commandos of the, Arme of, of the Armenian Genocide, assassinations of um, Turkish diplomats started to take place, bringing back an issue that the Turkish Republic and society had uh, decided had been closed, it, it sort of reintroduced the issue uh, to uh, collective memory and history in a way that was uh, very interesting. And that is why I uh, start from 1975 to 2009 and, and look at the, the late Republican period. The way uh, in my initial thing, and this will be the last thing I'll say about it, uh, is that I argue uh, the denial is multi-layered. It continues, you know, through history, and that is what makes it so difficult for Turkish state and society to accept it. In the first stage, what you see is the denial of origins, even though uh, the origins, uh, you know, of uh, the Armenian uh, unrest uh, is domestic. It is projected and presented as if it were internationally instigated. That's why I was very interested in yours. The second one is the denial of uh, the act, even though it is actually um, forced deportation with the intent to annihilate in most cases. It is presented as just a, a deportation out of military necess necessity. The third one uh, in stage three is the denial of the actors, even though many of the perpetrators uh, of uh, uh, the genocide were very significant officials. Uh, only a handful of them were tried. And then after the trials, the issue was considered closed when the majority of the perpetrators literally uh, passed into the Republic and became uh, the heroes and the leaders of uh, Turkish Republic. And that is therefore what you see is, I mean, 
That is why the Turkish uh, state uh, and uh, the Republic cannot accept uh, the genocide because it would implicate the entire foundation myth of the Turkish Republic, including all of its heroes, among them a couple of presidents, quite a number of prime ministers, and a lot of ministers, among others. And the final uh, one is uh, stage four is the denial of responsibility. Uh, which is, of course, the most significant uh, ethical dimension. And the reason that occurs is uh, because uh, what happens um, is that with the uh, uh, assassination of the Turkish diplomats, they try uh, suddenly to see what public narrative they have and, uh, you know, the official narrative they have in the foreign ministry to realize that they don't have anything because they consider this a closed issue. I mean, and that's how history and memory are sort of together and the erasure becomes so important. So then they called, uh, according to the memoirs, again, of, of one uh, person, they call uh, or they have a meeting with the prominent uh, scholars, you know, and they say, okay, write us a history that shows that we are right. <laughs> I mean, and of course, interestingly enough, according to the memoirs, you know, this retired diplomat says, I can't understand these scholars, you know, not only did they sort of refuse to help us, they even tried to tell us, like, what to do instead, you know. And basically, the scholars, therefore, in Turkey, sort of become silent and do not at all engage in this. And what they do instead is that they use retired diplomats to come up with historical accounts. Well, if you try to put somebody who's not trained as a historian to look into history, what you see is that, you know, because there is in, at present Armenian, you know, terrorist activity, they take that notion back into history so that from the beginning to the front you get this Armenian terrorist. I mean, so it's a very selective account. And that is, of course, totally destabilizes what history ought to be. Uh, in a way, exploits memory, you know. Uh, and then in the end they come up with this... Uh, interpretation where they say, no, they killed us, we killed them. I mean, you know, they were like violent there from the beginning and that they that totally destroys the responsibility. I'm hoping though, since post-Cold War, there is now within Turkey a new movement among scholars who are trained, uh, you know, scientifically and they would eventually be able to alter this. So even in the account that I gave you, you get a sense of how history and uh, memory uh, intertwine. What then, uh, within this paradigm, uh, sort of can you see these uh, dimensions of uh, history and uh, memory? What's very interesting in this uh, first stage is that, uh, well, well I actually I should tell it uh, with this. In the first um, stage, of the imperial period, uh, you do have in the public sphere an official account, mostly written by court uh, chroniclers, and unofficial, uh, mostly uh, and the official account of the court chroniclers are uh, very much structured around the dynasty. I mean, you know, so that becomes, is the sort of organizing principle. Whereas if you look at the unofficial accounts, they could be uh, in the uh, advice sort of, you know, advice uh, treaties manuscripts to the sultan is one way um, and also some uh, religious uh, scholars accounts would be another uh, and these seem to be mostly uh, what's happening in the memory part of course you do have individual memories especially dreams uh, you know dream sequences uh, are make an interesting uh, one uh, other memories uh, are, of course, of, of travelogues and people traveling and then being bringing in their own uh, thing. Communal is interesting because uh, uh, communal is, again, religiously organized uh, either, or uh, uh, it could be spatially organized, that you have geographies, certain parts of the empire gives one a certain identity. What is not yet there is societal, so that's why those sort of come later. But what interests me in this is the whole idea of, of sort of an imperial uh, history and memory, how that is similar to and different from national uh, history and memory. I mean, I think there are, we haven't yet studied how those transformations occur as much as uh, we should have. 
What happens um, in the transition uh, with the Young Turks coming to power is that with it you have these notions of, of modernity that come as well. And what you see there is once they replace this dynastic religious uh, sort of system of the Sultan, they do not have enough uh, uh, power to legitimate uh, I mean, uh, their presence. As a consequence, uh, they start, they put the constitution in place, but they cannot make it work because people think there's this abstract thing and they don't want to abide by it. So guess what happens? They start using violence and the violence they use is extra legal violence. I mean, so that is when you have these paramilitary groups introduced into the system is with Young Turk rule. And that is why I sort of have uh, introduced this extra official history. This is a history of the Ottoman and later Turkish states, but it is through the violence they committed, basically. And it is not the official history. So you see this very interesting divergence that is significant in that it not only is there during the Young Turk period, it translates exactly in the same way into the Turkish Republican period as well. So, of course, it starts to destabilize the official because there is now this extra-official uh, dimension uh, uh, and nar narrative that's also important. With respect to memory, what is interesting is that you do have, in addition to individual ones, communal memory mostly around the millet system, the milla, or, or uh, as I said, uh, even you can say the sort of Islamic community as well, I mean, in, in, in terms of religious scholars uh, writing such things. And the Armenian, of course, communal uh, uh, memory is very important in that co context as well. With the Young Turks, though, there is sort of Benedict Anderson's this notion of an imagined community that comes in addition uh, to the individual and traditional communal one. And what is going to go in there? I think that is when all the exclusion starts to happen. And that is when, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-Turks uh, start to be taken out of the equation. And then later on, religious people are taken out of the equation with the secularists uh, uh, moving to the forefront. And then people like me, basically my class background, meaning ethnic, secular, uh, progressive, uh, people sort of become uh, the dominant, uh, you know, uh, group uh, at the expense of all these, uh, you know, of the rest uh, who are excluded. So um, that I think is now being contested in Turkey today. If you look at the whole thing in terms of uh, erasures uh, with respect to history and memory, I think one thing that is, uh, there are two things actually that are very significant in Turkish history and maybe we can talk about it. One is, of course, in 1928, uh, the abolition of uh, the Arabic script and the taking over of the Latin script. That, of course, literally alienated the entire Republican, uh, you know, citizen uh, to their own history. I mean, you know, I, I've learned, uh, I know Ottoman, you know, I've learned it, but people look at me and they cannot for the life of them think that I can actually read it because I look modern. I don't look religious, so that's sort of something uh, to keep in mind. What does that do to a nation's memory or, uh, I mean, collectivity? And that was the public erasure I had in mind. The second one has to do with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's very significant speech, uh, the Nutuk, uh, famous speech in 1927 that went on for three days straight. What he did was he gave his version of the independence struggle from the beginning till the end. I mean, you know, much to the distress of his uh, comrades in arms because they sort of realized that everybody had been taken out of the account and Mustafa Kemal looked like he had single-handedly carried out this whole thing. I mean, you know. And the very interesting thing is by doing this, which is of course a very uh, um, intelligent move, that his account beca became the official account of the Turkish Republic. As a consequence, you have this very bizarre intersection of history and memory. In Turkey, sort of history became the memory, memory became history. And I think because of that, we're still trying to unravel 
history and memory in Turkey today. That probably is sort of what to keep, uh, you know, how could one talk about history done in a scientific manner when the official history is predicated on the memory of one person? And it starts, the first sentence says, I alighted in Anatolia on 19th of May 1919, which means that anything that went on before 1919 becomes prehistory. I mean, you know, and 1915 and 17, of course, therefore does not exist. These are the kinds of things that one has to take into account. And I will uh, stop here because I ran uh, over my time, but I just want to also bring in my own subjectivity because this is also something that is very contested. Uh, one assumes that, of course, as a scholar, I am objective, uh, or if I am not, the community of scholars to which I belong will hold me you know, uh, responsible in one way or another. But nevertheless, doesn't the fact that I am an ethnic Turk make a difference? I mean, this is, I think, why the issue of identity is important. I mean, I may not accept being uh, you know, an ethnic Turk, but nevertheless, other people attribute that to me. And in the context of what I'm writing, it does become an important part of my identity that I have to acknowledge, even if I accept it or not. And that is maybe something to keep in mind. I mean, where do we as scholars and as people located in society uh, accept uh, which identities, at what context, at the expense of what, which other ones? And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Okay, you described the continuity. Yes. Where do you see the, the uniqueness or the specialty, actually, of the genocide? I mean, the genocide <coughs> doesn't go on over 200 years. So we, by emphasizing the continuity, you're losing some uniqueness. So maybe you can explore, just illuminate that a little bit. You see, there are two things. Uh, uh, I make the argument that uh, there was a structural divide in uh, Ottoman society, uh, one between the Muslims and non-Muslims. That is very significant in the way the society is structured in that uh, uh, the non-Muslim communities, at least the Jews, Greeks, and Armenians, are self-governing to a certain degree, which is important. But from my point of view as a sociologist, uh, what is more significant is that you cannot intermarry. And I think that is extremely important in the long term because when you socially reproduce, especially in terms of violence, uh, usually who can you count on? You count on you know, your kin. Well, if you cannot have kin uh, from you know, a certain group, I think their chances of survival uh, lessens dramatically. So that, I think, is a very significant structural divide that is combined over time, of course, uh, with uh, sort of economics becoming very significant. And, and of course, the minorities who did, were very active in the economic sphere suddenly tried to acquire power, which uh, to the detriment of uh, the ethnic Turks who lose power. So that polarizes things in addition. But what is significant, if you look at uh, the massacres of 1894-96 that preceded it, uh, they were not intentional in the, and they were not systematic. In the sense, most of them occurred because of uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid's reticence uh, to send in troops, fearing Western intervention. Because of that late uh, intervention in many places uh, when there were uh, sort of, there was some Armenian unrest, uh, since also the minorities in Ottoman society could not uh, own and carry arms, they could not defend themselves, which meant that, you know, with the unrest, of course, accompanied by some gossip, Muslims usually uh, got together took their arms and stormed uh, the non-Muslim neighborhoods um, as a consequence of which, you know, destroying many. But it wasn't done in a systematic way. They did it in certain parts. In other parts, the elderly somehow were able to keep them, you know, uh, cool and collected. At other times, uh, the security forces went there in time. I mean, so there was a lot of variation. I mean, the Sultan, to my uh, knowledge did not say 
go out and take these people out because he still had the conception that these people were still a part of his flock, as he put it, like a flock of sheep. I mean, so he kept this flock, uh, you know, he punished this flock when they needed punishment because they were also his children, you know, but nevertheless, he didn't like excommunicate the man, you know, throw them away and say, you're no longer human, you're no longer my child. I mean, whereas I think what happened in 1915-17 is that you do have this sense of the development of a body politic uh, by the young Turks. And according to that body politic, uh, the ethnic Turks or Muslims are in there. And the other ones, according you know, to some uh, things, are seen as cancerous cells that need to be excised. Now that is a very different approach than the one I told about the Sultan. You know, one is, that's what I think is dramatically different. Uh, so I would say the continuity uh, breaks down initially with the Young Turks. And that uh, positionality also continues, I'm going to argue in my next book, you know, uh, in the Republican era with the Kurds, because the same violence is then, uh, you know, uh, projected onto Kurds who are not ethnic Turks. And that is, I think, what the dramatic difference is. I hope you are. that's okay. Yeah, sure. When you give the number, uh, when you give the number of the uh, decrease in the percentage of minorities, do you have any evidence how much of it is migration? Uh, second, uh, when uh, you talk about the sultan and the flock, could you argue that the, the loss of this religious veneer with the Republicans denies the state of the responsibility that Muslims have to Zemi? It's our Ahmed Qatar, Jews and Christians are protected by our enemies. So Sultan was, by theological precept, uh, responsible for the flock. And finally, the, when you talk about uh, this imagined community, does Turkish become the cement of this new identity? Yeah. Uh, starting from the back, yes. Uh, Turkish does become the cement. And it's interesting because uh, young Turk is first come up with the idea. If, I mean, this is the other thing, talking about sort of sacred histories. We, of course, now have the sacred Republican history, which is Mustafa Kemal's own narrative, according to which also he also takes on ownership of all the reforms that were done in Turkey. But now we have, uh, you know, we're historicizing, or at least some people are, and you realize most of these reforms all came up during the Young Turk era. So he basically, can, I mean, implemented what was done before. Uh, and yes, Turkish does become, uh, uh, the language does become, uh, it's supposed to be a Turkish language in a cultural sense, that it is all the language, so everyone who speaks Turkish would be a part of the community, but over time, it then uh, acquires an ethnic dimension to it, so that even though you may know very good uh, Turkish, even, I mean, if you're not ethnically Turkish, you become excluded. It goes from a cultural to an ethnic exclusion later on. Uh, responsibility denied, yes. I mean, I made that argument in an article I wrote for some uh, on righteous Turks, because uh, they're actually righteous Muslims. There were quite a number of Muslims who took issue with what was going on, saying this is totally against Islamic principles, or at least there is the Medina agree agreement too. They talk about, you know, you may be okay, you know, deporting the males or males of sort of, you know, adult age, but you have not nowhere it writes about women, children, and the elderly. I mean, and that was the grounds on which, you know, and most of those, they also lost their lives. We're now slowly, you know, uh, uh, coming to that, but interestingly enough, that is why I said to the Justice and Development Party, at least, you know, to, to those who are close to it, why don't you bring if you want to use religion, this is the perfect context within which to bring back religion and say, according to Islam, this was wrong. And, and, and they've started to do it, uh, which is interesting in Turkey today. But of course, the you know, comparison with Iran is so interesting because you know, with you, religion is you know, destructive. With us, it still has some constructive potential because we're at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, how much of it is migration? That is very difficult uh, to know. 
Um, but uh, they said that if if these uh, you know if the genocide or these uh, earlier massacres and things did not occur, there ought to be about 20 million Armenians in Turkey today. I mean, you know, so I don't think migration alone would explain uh, it, even though that is another argument the official narratives make, saying, you know, they all left where, we don't know. And then they say, well, some didn't leave, but there are no tombstones, so obviously, if there are no tombstones, it means that they didn't die. I mean, you know, there are these very interesting, bizarre arguments made, but none of them hold. Uh, yes, there was some migration, but... Nevertheless, uh, there is a systematic destruction in some cases. In other cases, depending on the governor's overseeing and the uh, governor's political stance, some survived more than others did uh, in the carrying out of the deportation order. So it was not, uh, you know, total. And that is why people have so much uh, uh, conflict because, you know, in a case where it's gray, I mean, you know, you can argue all you want saying, look at the black, look at the black, and the other one says, look at the white, look at the white. Well, as we say, I mean, I don't know whether that's contingency or not, but believe me, there's a lot of gray there. I mean, you know, so how do you deal with the gray? Uh, that, I think that's the problem we have in this case. I want to go back to your final remarks uh, about your own personal scholarly position, or how shall I put your positionality. Many of us sitting around this table are dealing with the same issue. Could you say a bit more about what goes through your mind as you're working through? You see, that's very interesting because that comes, of course, uh, that came as a consequence, I teach uh, so social theory. I mean, so I had to deal with like feminist theory, race theory, critical theory. I mean, you know, and you apply this to yourself. I mean, and I say, okay, now where, where do I stand on these issues? I come from uh, a very nice bourgeois family, uh, you know, no political engagement at all, always very successful. And suddenly I ask this question and like the whole thing, started to unravel. Uh, I never thought, I mean, you know, uh, basically the way I came to it, I was very nicely looking at westernization, you know, studying, and my first uh, two books were on that. And then I said, well, but it, uh, as a consequence of westernization, we destroyed the Ottoman bourgeoisie. The Ottoman bourgeoisie was basically Jewish, Greek, and Armenian uh, bourgeoisie. And then they tried to create a Turkish bourgeoisie instead of it. And I said, but this must mean in terms of the consequences, this must have such adverse consequences on Turkey and its possibility of having a democracy. Let me go through and try to see, you know, how this occurred, why this occurred, you know? That's how I decided to, and I said, um, I wanted to study the Islamist movement in Turkey. I mean, you know, uh, to get a sense of whether that would replace the secular one. But then, whenever I gave presentations, people said, look, the military in your case is the one calling the shots. Why are you studying the Islamists? Study the military. I said, have you lost your mind? I mean, you know, I can't study the military because if you do, who knows where you'll end up. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm crazy, but not that crazy. So as a consequence, though, I said, why is it that the Turkish society accepts military coups so easily? I mean, you know, why is it that violence comes to us so naturally? When did this violence become naturalized? And then I, there is a foundational violence that was unaccounted for. That is how I went back to the Armenians. I mean, you know, of course people said I'm Armenian. Uh, you know, no, I mean, I have no problem being an Armenian, but I mean, this is how I started studying. Uh, this issue is that that is how I ended up with 1915. Then I lost a lot of friends who, of course, couldn't understand, which was why, what I was doing. I, but I made some other friends. I received death threats. Uh, interestingly enough, though, from uh, mostly American Turks who are like the most virulent you know, you said that, I mean, and this is funny, you would appreciate this. I would get these emails saying, what kind of a Turk are you? 
Do you think being a scholar is more important than being a Turk? I'm saying, what? I mean, it never even occurred to me. I mean, you know, so that I think is important, even though the Turkish state and official position, they were very cool. They said, as long as you stay in the academic sphere, because it goes back to how many people are going to read you, probably five, you know, or 10, they have no problem with it. Uh, but I don't know once this denial book comes out whether uh, they like it or not. But again, uh, my brother always says he reads my books uh, to put himself to sleep. He's a businessman, so I mean, you know, maybe they'll let me go. But those are the things that come to mind. <laughs> thank you. So our next speaker uh, is uh, Emily Wong, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Cultural Studies uh, at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, professor Wong uh, has been a lecturer in modern history at Graz University and a member of the ITF Task Force for International Cooperation on Holocaust Education, Remembrance, and Research. Uh, she works closely with a number of groups uh, in Europe having to do with the commemoration of museums, having to do uh, with the Holocaust and thinking about the Holocaust in uh, a, a commemorative uh, ways. Uh, she's the uh, editor of a number of books and author of very many interesting articles on the issue of memory, history, uh, and culture today. So, Helen Marie, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and for all the inspiring ideas I've got uh, within this uh, hour since we started. And I can continue uh, to your uh, uh, lecture because uh, the, in Austria and I would say in the west, western parts of Europe, uh, the situation is ex exactly on the contrary. If I am, uh, and many of my colleagues in France, in the Netherlands, uh, in Belgium, and so on, are, so to say, talking and discussing about these issues of a former neglected history, they are, so to say, the completely mainstream. And people would not say, do not do this, but, oh, it's boring. So this is the situation you are confronted with in Austria, and not only there. So uh, I tried uh, just to, to rewrite a little bit my paper to, to answer to all the interesting questions which came out. And uh, what I want to speak about is uh, the recent developments in European memory, or I will define it mostly in Western European memory, because we have now a kind of new border between the post-communist countries and Western Europe. And uh, what I've tried to call the logics of comparison, that means that, that there are some dilemmas uh, inherent in the way we are dealing with the Holocaust in Europe today, and I want to say in Europe, uh, because uh, as we all know, it's a completely different perspective, for example, than in Israel. Even the question, what should we learn from the Holocaust, and uh, what is the meaning uh, of learning from this history, I would say is very different, but maybe we can come to this in the discussion. Uh, to speak about European memory uh, is a very recent process. Uh, there are two reasons, I would say, or, or maybe three, uh, that we can speak since the mid of the 80s, the beginning of the 80s, of a kind of Europeanization of national cultures of remembrance. Uh, these three points, uh, 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 the process of in intensifying uh, the European integration and the idea which came up for the first time uh, that Europe, uh, united Europe, has to have a shared memory. The second thing is uh, the change of generations and uh, this, uh, so to say, the, the um, agency and the initiatives and uh, activism in the field of remembrance was mostly, uh, so to say, the project of uh, the generation which was called by Jay Winter the generation of memory, which now wanted exactly to do the opposite from what uh, the generation before has done, uh, to externalize, and you use this term, uh, the crimes of the past, uh, and now to, so to say, start the project of internalize, uh, inter internalizing these crimes. And uh, this is, so to say, the background for the break of the national post-war myths, I quote here Donny Chad, uh, 
Uh, and uh, this poster is mainly focused on the argument of the innocence of her own people and of the externalization and, so to say, uh, putting the blame for all the crimes uh, in the Holocaust uh, to the German. And how successful this uh, externalization since 1945 has been shows the Austrian case very good. The, from 1945, the Declaration of Independence, until the Waldheim debate in 1986, uh, each and every one also me, uh, was convinced that this is uh, the history which happened, yes. So this new European culture of remembrance uh, is uh, the result of an, uh, a, a radical change in perspective, the acknowledgement of the guilt of nations and the acknowledgement of the responsibility of today's society for state crimes and mass atrocities. This change in perspective was not, so to say, something which came overnight, but it was uh, a very highly controversial process of negotiation in intensive public debates in the 1980s. And nearly each Western European country had its, so to say, watershed battle on memory. I only want to quote three. In Germany, it was the so-called struggle of historians in 1986. Uh, the question was, uh, can we uh, compare or even equalize uh, the war crimes uh, of uh, the Soviet army, the expulsion of a German, uh, of how women were treated at the end of the war, with the Holocaust. And uh, 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 Professor Nolte, a very well-known but an historian of the old generation, I would say, who wrote this in a very small booklet, was extremely discussed. And the result, the interesting result of this um, historical streit was, so to say, that you are not allowed to compare the Holocaust to anything else. That was really learning from the historical streit. And this, so to say, um, uh, very, very uh, um, a negative uh, attitude to any, any kind of uh, comparison is, I would say, still part of this European uh, pattern of new, uh, new ways of dealing with the past. In Austria, it was a Waldheim debate on the involvement of uh, Waldheim and many, many Austrians into the German Wehrmacht. Uh, for example, in these days, uh, uh, the, the central monument for the fallen soldiers in, of World War II and World War I uh, which is, so to say, the central monument of the state is highly discussed in Austria, and there will be a commission uh, to uh, just to, uh, to raise, uh, to, to debate and to come to a result how Austria today shall deal with uh, the tradition of uh, commemorate, commemorating the former soldiers when it also includes German Wehrmacht and even SS men. In France, it was, I just uh, uh, bring all to Athens, the book of Henri Rousseau about the Vichy syndrome, but also to show that there are many different so to say, ways of breaking this post -war myths. One I initiated by historians, as young Gross in Poland did it, uh, but mostly it was a Western European experience, and the Polish case, so to say, with uh, an historian which originally or a journalist, I think, he was not in, in Poland uh, in this time, he came from the States, so it came from outside. Mm -hmm. Just this intervention of, what I would say, Western attitudes uh, brought a very, so to say, Western uh, debate. After 1989, uh, these debates uh, also affected more or less uh, post-communist countries, but I don't want to go into detail. The situation here is, I think, very different in these countries until today. What is the situation now? What is, so to say, the result of these battles on collective and national memory? And that's the point. If it is a battle, if it is a struggle, uh, it has to have something which is the goal of it. And it cannot be the goal on, on an individual level or on a regional or local level, more or less. But what is, so to say, what you can gain or lose in the struggles is to define the collective national memory and memory. And that was, so to say, uh, the aim of all these conflicts. And uh, the result we can see in many different aspects 
uh, cultural, on the historical uh, level, as well in the political sphere. Uh, on the one hand, the Holocaust and its victims is now in the very center of European memory culture. I only want to recall uh, uh, the well-known Berlin mon monument on the European Jews and the extermination, which is, so to say, the defining uh, place uh, to show how this memory is aesthetically today represented. The second point is uh, the takeover of a responsibility for these crimes by the society, by the generation which is now just, so to say, uh, um, acting. Uh, Reinhard Koselek has called this as a completely new attitude in memory uh, in the sense that it is not anymore, as we know it from the 19th century, the pride of nations we are talking of, but it is the negative uh, memory uh, we are talking of. And it is also expected that immigrants, which come to Germany, Austria, and so on, that they, so to say, integrate themselves into this way of thinking. To become a German, you have to have, uh, you don't have to share it, but you have to respect and acknowledge that this is the German or Austrian way of dealing with past. So you have uh, at least three layers of this new European memory. The one is, I, I uh, mentioned it, the official layer, which is very important. Uh, and it's very important also to show officially what is a new attitude. And that's the reason why so many uh, Holocaust monuments have been erected in the very center of the cities, in Vienna, in Berlin, in most of the uh, uh, German uh, capitals of the Federal Republic, in Graz, which is not a very large town. The uh, synagogue, which was destroyed in 1938, was now rebuilt, so to say, as a symbolic sign of uh, a new uh, way of dealing with the past. And uh, I come to this idea of reconciliation. Uh, with, with new discussions, for example, in 1987, uh, uh, in the really uh, high time of the Waldheim debate, the major of Graz, uh, the town where I studied, has visited for the first time the Jewish community in Graz. So it was a new way of, so to say, trying to get uh, a kind of uh, a connection, a kind of, uh, uh, so to say, uh, just to, to a, a, to ho a hope for uh, reconciliation is not the term I would like to use, but I hope that uh, the, the uh, Jewish people who were uh, treated so bad, so to say, they can use step in just um, accepting uh, what the Austrian society and many others do. And it was uh, uh, in many cases successful. Uh, to this official, uh, so to say, the repertoire of the official memory, uh, you can find, I think, in each and every country, even in the Vatican, as far as I know, this, this speech of, so to say, confession of guilt. And uh, that was uh, uh, what uh, Elisa Barkan uh, quoted, or uh, the term he coined. Uh, that is what you have to do, so to say, to be in this... Um, symbolic field of European memory. So to be European, you have to have all these, so to say, cultural skills to deal in this way with the past. That's a problem with Turkey, uh, that if you don't do this, you are, so to say, you put yourself outside of the European, um, uh, European uh, civilization. And this European civilization is defined uh, in the way you deal with uh, the negative past of your country. You have, as a second layer, and I think that's very interesting, uh, but uh, if we go to the local, and that's the second layer, we have, of course, a, a kind of a crucial uh, difference if we speak uh, about a global universal Holocaust memory, which is, in fact, the case if you look at uh, US Holocaust Memorial Museums and so on. We have, uh, I think, in uh, uh, in, in, in Japan and in South Africa, we have uh, Holocaust Memorial Museums, but it's a difference to have a museum uh, or to have a memorial museum or to have the concrete site where things happen. And I think this difference will uh, be uh, very important for the future 
because if it comes to the concrete side, to the local side, you have on the one hand uh, people who are living there, and when you speak about guilt and about responsibility, uh, you don't speak in abstract terms, but the victims as well as the perpetrators are your neighbors, maybe your uh, relatives, uh, uh, and so on. So that gives still attention to this very negotiated and very mainstream Holocaust memory uh, in Europe. And you can see this interest of this generation, uh, not of, uh, in the first stage of the officials, but of uh, initiatives, people who wanted to commit themselves to these projects. Uh, in Berlin, everything you can see now is a huge, uh, wonderful, highly uh, financed museum have started as a NGO activist groups just burying out uh, the, the remains of, for example, the Reichssicherheitshauptamt at the topography of terrors. The third one is a transnational level, and this transnational level is a, uh, has a very interesting and very important, so to say, has uh, created a form of institutional institutionalization of uh, remembrance in education and research, and this is the international task force the task force, ITF, a task force for international cooperation in Holocaust education, remembrance, and research. Uh, just a few words about it. It was found in, in the, founded in 2000, the result of a conference in Stockholm, and uh, uh, their uh, um, uh, document was uh, accepted by the members, many high-ranking politicians and historians, the so-called Stockholm Declaration, and this declaration so to say, states the singularity, the uniqueness of the Holocaust as the deepest watershed event in the history of modern civilization. Uh, but it's not only, so to say, a, an official declaration done by many prime ministers uh, and so on. Uh, if you uh, uh, want to become a member of this ITF, uh, you have to do something and you have to finance something. And as so to say, the most concrete things you have to do is the implementation of Holocaust Memorial Days in your country and the Im implementation of Holocaust education in your country. And where I want to, so to say, um, uh, to, to raise the, the, the question I, uh, I underlie my um, uh, my uh, statement um, that there is a kind of, so to say, um, theoretical or philosophical tension in the Holocaust memory itself. If we speak about the Holocaust as a unique, as a singular event in history, uh, it's, so to say, has nothing to do with memory, yes? But we have to connect the Holocaust uh, to uh, ev events uh, which have a relevance for today, because otherwise learning from history from the Holocaust wouldn't make any sense if you cannot connect it to anything which is relevant for today. So you have on the one hand, if you look again at the International Task Force, uh, the, uh, so to say, uh, the declaration of uh, uh, uniqueness or singularity of the Holocaust, on the other hand, uh, you have to compare it to recent events to recent problems, and you, can, you have two ways uh, in co of comparing. The one is to say, okay, this uh, cannot be compared to anything, but again, when it's not relevant for today. So you have to find something similar today in the Holocaust, and that makes, uh, so to say, that uh, is now uh, uh, the tendency in the last years that there are I would say three ways of connecting the Holocaust with uh, the recent time, uh, the Holocaust memory uh, with uh, uh, recent problems in society. Uh, these three ways, and I want to make it uh, short, uh, which we can observe, there is not an official declaration which says we have to do it in this and that way, uh, but the basic is of course and why the Holocaust is so relevant in a universal uh, uh, perspective is that it has become, we all know that it was not for decades, 
that it has become, uh, so to say, the, the uh, uh, reverence for uh, the values and, uh, of, of uh, modern Western civilization. And if you want to connect the Holocaust with today, you have to find something which challenges these values. And these challenges are mostly found in, and these are the two ways I want to, uh, to, to point out, in civil rights, human rights, and in genocide. I want to present very shortly the third case, which is a comparison of Holocaust with uh, communist and Stalinist crime. But I think that is a, only a local European issue with uh, a very uh, low impact on, on the international discussion. So I want uh, to uh, uh, focus very shortly on these two aspects and what are the consequences for the history of a narrative, as Gabriel Motzkin pointed out. Um, Holocaust and human rights. I uh, brought with me an example, and you can uh, please, uh, I have put it on my table, you can just have a look on it. Uh, five years ago, the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna, which is only based in Vienna, it's a European agency, launched a five years program with an explicit goal to strengthen the connection between the Holocaust and human rights. What did they do? They developed uh, teaching materials, as you can see here, excursion to the past, teaching for the future, handbook for teachers in visiting concrete sites. And you have a very prominent picture. Uh, uh, this is, of course, the entrance to uh, the memorial site of Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, these materials, you can see, so to say, uh, the, the English version was uh, translated in many European languages. Uh, they developed special courses, for example, at Buchenwald about human rights, and organized meetings with, politician make, uh, with politicians, decision makers, teachers, students, and so on, some weeks ago in Copenhagen, for example. So uh, this uh, um, program of a fundamental rights agency was a perfect example for a successful campaign. Uh, in the center or the basic that this could, uh, so to say, be connected, that this connection, this comparison could function, and this is, so to say, the basic narrative. The Holocaust is, uh, so to say, narrative in all these concepts of memory, is uh, Raoul Hilberg's, so to say, basic narrative model that has become the most influential uh, to uh, distinguish between uh, victim, perf victims, perpetrators, and bystanders. If you look at the booklet and what it uh, tells you, and I think it's on uh, page 46 where you can find this, uh, uh, if you look at the booklet, victims and perpetrator are not in the foreground of this approach, but the bystanders. They are, so to say, in the center of a human rights education approach. The silent majority, as they are called. But why have the bystanders now gained such an importance in so many educational concepts? Uh, the bystanders are the only group, or mostly the only group, which can make moral choices. And moral choices is what, or the, how to make moral choices is one of the main principles of, of human rights education. What example can we find in the booklet, so to say, how is the Holocaust represented through the lens, through the eyes of uh, human rights education? There are three example mentions, and I mentioned just to say how narrowed the Holocaust is in this concept. Uh, the uh, Vienna, uh, um, uh, so to say, the pogroms uh, 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 in the occupation days when uh, Jewish Viennese were forced uh, to clean the streets. Um, at Hausen a concentration camp, where a lady uh, uh, protested against what she saw from outside. It just was a farmhouse outside. And a little German town, where you can see a crowd waiting for the public sale of Aryanized furniture. So you can imagine what scholars are criticizing on this human rights uh, concept, uh, so to say, just uh, brought to, or how it narrows the history of the Holocaust. Human rights, I did try to, to summarize it. Human rights education asks the wrong questions on the history of the Holocaust. It does not ask 
how democracy has failed in Germany and not uh, what are the structural and economic interests which are behind the Holocaust and uh, the treatment of a Jewish uh, population, but it makes human right to a personal individu individual decision in a concrete situation. So what about people, if we read this booklet, who did not experience, so to say, a, a situation of a violence, a violencing of human rights? Uh, so to sum, to sum up uh, what critical voices, uh, especially also in the task force, say, you do not need Auschwitz or any other concentration camp to teach about human rights. Maybe you should look at the offices of a Ministry of Justice in Germany, for example. Second, second way uh, of connecting the Holocaust with the present, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Holocaust and genocide. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, so the implementation of uh, the term of genocide into Holocaust studies uh, led on the one hand uh, to many institutional, so to say, overlappings in institutions, for example, in the Netherlands or in other places, which now connect Holocaust studies with genocide studies. And there are some uh, uh, um, journalists on this. And it also changed, so to say, the basic definition of a Holocaust. And I only want to qu quote Yehuda Bauer. He was one of the founding fathers of the task force and uh, many years uh, the academic advisor. In 2006, at the first commemoration on January 27, the liberation day of Auschwitz at the UN Assembly in New York, uh, Yehuda Bauer defined the Holocaust as a very diplomatic, specific, most extreme form of genocide, and he also defined Auschwitz as a site of genocide, surprisingly. Um, this had also, uh, you can observe also the impact, for example, of uh, Holocaust Memorial Day cultures in France and in the UK. Uh, 20, uh, 21st of January is connected also to programs of genocide, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, about uh, information on genocide. Uh, but there are also very strong critics about this, so to say, to, to combine uh, this term with the Holocaust. And uh, uh, just want to mention some. Um, there is, of course, a very uh, sort of a legitimate link between the Holocaust and the definition and the history of the Genocide Convention, and that's a very good combination. But to use the term genocide uh, promises in the recent European discussion, especially in Eastern European, a kind of symbolic capital, to use Pierre Bourdieu's term, a privileged position in the struggle for successful, uh, so to say, definition of national memory, because to claim that a specific ethnic group, of course, uh, uh, the group somebody is part of or committed to has become victim of genocide means uh, that this group is completely innocent. So genocide means that you have, so to say, the Holocaust narrative uh, just uh, brought about a situation which is mostly very complex, which has a uh, dimension of civil war of, uh, or of um, uh, uh, constellations of social or ideological uh, uh, motivated mass crimes or expulsion, and that you now uh, sort of say redefine and decomplex the situations, and, and that's the point, uh, to say somebody is a victim of genocide means each and every member of this group is innocent, and the group as a whole. Uh, the second point is uh, that, uh, on the one hand, as, as I said, that the often uh, extremely highly complex constellations are now brought to a very, sim uh, 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 so to say, very simple uh, uh, picture. The second one is that if we speak of genocide, we speak of ethnicity, and uh, with this term, all the controversial debates of ethnic identity or ethnic belonging uh, now raise up immediately. And for example, you, I don't want uh, to, I only want to, to uh, 
um, a quote, one uh, struggle where the term genocide was extremely important and, and that was the so-called Holodomor in the Ukraine. Uh, the great famine, uh, the, the uh, communists were, so to say, blamed uh, just to extermine the Ukrainian people. And uh, this was uh, really an incredibly um, intensive uh, uh, campaign of the uh, Ukrainian government. And it was, so to say, uh, uh, labeled with the term the Holocaust before the Holocaust. So just uh, one example from Eastern Europe. I, I think we run out of time. Uh, should I say some words to the communist comparison or should I? Okay, I'll leave it away. Okay. So I come to the conclusion. Of, I, I think this is the most, uh, most important. Um, what does it mean to compare the Holocaust uh, to human rights on the one hand and to genocide on the other hand? Um, it means on the one hand that uh, these, uh, just so to say, is combined with a narrative which has universal ahistoric categories, namely the categories of perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. So the historical narrative of the Holocaust is replaced by an anthropological narrative. And it ends up with a question, or what we can learn is, what are human beings able to do to other human beings? And the Holocaust becomes a symbol of all evil in human nature. So we don't speak of national socialism, we don't speak of Germany, we don't speak of Europe or anything else, we don't speak of liberation, of war, we speak about humanity and uh, the evil which can, uh, so to say, come into, into the world. Uh, and I, I want to end with one question which uh, is a kind of answer to what Gabriel Motzkin said at the beginning. Uh, Jews do not have to negotiate with Germans. So that's my question. I'm not sure that the Holocaust and genocide similar to the Holocaust of his will to exterminate the whole people is the right point of reference uh, because you have here really the singular or the mostly uh, very rare cause that the victims are really innocent, yes? You do not have situations where this innocence is not so given, for example, at the Balkans or in the, uh, so to say, uh, partisan uh, activities against uh, German Wehrmacht. And the question is why it is so important to have a kind of uh, identifying uh, uh, individual or collective uh, which uh, has to fulfill this kind of innocence. And maybe, and now we are coming a little bit to this question, are there some uh, religious backgrounds to uh, secular memory also? From my personal background, or from my collective background, from the background of a, a, so a society I was raised, which is Christian and Catholic, there is a strong desire to identify with somebody who is completely innocent. Uh, but uh, you come at the end to a very paradox situation where is one blind spot in each and every of these con uh, concepts of connecting the Holocaust to the present days. And this blind spot is obviously Israel. And nobody, I discussed it in, in Copenhagen with some people because it was suddenly raised, really Nobody said, I would raise this connection in the classroom because there are so strong, so to say, negative attitudes towards Israel. And uh, so to say, the situation has now turned to the opposite thing. The uh, Israelis are now, so to say, the guilty ones, and the Palestinians are the innocent ones in the projection from the European point of view. So um, what um, I would suggest on the one hand, uh, that uh, all these materials should have also the point, has a history of a situation of Israel something to do with the Holocaust, which should be brought to the minds of European students. The second point is, if we are looking at the concrete situation, uh, we are, uh, so to say, raising now the Israel-Palestine conflict, 
wouldn't it be better or wouldn't it be a, a good uh, 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 additional situation to look, for example, uh, at former Yugoslavia, at Serbia, where you have this uh, uh, steadily, um, so to say, negotiations upon the guilt of the others, which and nobody was innocent. Thank you. Okay, um, I have just the following comment, which is obviously start off with generality and singularity. In other words, uh, genocide or holocaust or extermination is something that can happen to everybody, and yet each case is singular. However, that leads me to another observation, which has to do with the holocaust, and I'm going to get to the Nakba. Because the holocaust, you see, exists in the way it does because the Jewish population is not there. And because the Jewish population in Eastern and Central Europe was eliminated, it can become a theological moment for Europeans. And that theological moment means that we have to distinguish between one's responsibility, if one has one, to the Jews who are the heirs of the Holocaust, and one's own narrative in which the Holocaust has a place. In the same way, I would like to suggest there is a difference between taking the Nakba into Israeli history and saying all Israelis should learn the Nakba and saying, no, you have responsibility to current Palestinians. Those are not the same thing. They can be related, but they don't have to be. Now, I think the distinction I want to make, because I would like to say that at one extreme, one could say one takes one's theological requirement uh, seriously, but one has no responsibility to the contemporary heirs, or at the other extreme, one could say, let's forget about the history, but one has all entirely responsibility to one's contemporary heirs. And those things are in constant tension. And there is no possibility, I think, of just saying there's a one-to-one -one connection, of saying that because of the past, we have to act a certain way in the present, that we have a responsibility to the past, but we also have a responsibility to the present, and these are never identical. And they can't be because we are implicated in the successive history which changes the categories all the time. So we don't stop in 1943 in Germany, we don't stop in 1948 in Palestine, we go on and then we have to think out of that concrete situation what our particular negotiation of that asymmetry is. You want to say something to that? I think I can just... It stands on its own. Okay, over. Um, so I have two, two sets of, of questions, comments. One, one has to do with the more general issues that you raised. Uh, first about genocide. I, I mean, I think most, most people here would, would agree the genocide is not uh, about the victims. It's about the perpetrators. So what, what the Genocide Convention does, it says a, a, a state or an organization defines a certain group as a group that ought to be eliminated. What that group is has got nothing to do with it. So innocence does not come into it at all. It doesn't matter whether the group being killed is innocent or not. And the, that, that debate, that sort of um, assumption that victims of genocide are innocent is an assumption that we can make on the moral level. They're, they're innocent to the extent that one ought not to have murdered them. But the killing of them has nothing to do with their innocence. It has to do with how they're defined. That's, that's, that's the first thing. The second is on, I think that you drew a sort of parallel between two things, and, and, and that's between comparability, if the Holocaust is unique or not, and the second is about teaching and morality. Um, I, I don't think that there's anyone um, in scholarship today who um, makes the, maybe apart from one person who teaches at BU, uh, who, who talks about the Holocaust as being unique. Because historically, it's meaningless. And in fact, there is a whole body of scholarship that has been created in the last 20, 30 years, which is comparative genocide. And that scholarship started off with scholarship on the Holocaust, and then branched off to comparative genocide. That is now the new new. Th this is what people do. The old, the boring thing is just doing the Holocaust. The new scholarship is comparative genocide. Now, within that scholarship, there is in, indeed a competition. And that competition is uh, often either assumed so one wants to make a strong case, one says, 
Well, everybody says that the Holocaust is unique, and I will show you that it isn't, but no one actually says it. Or it's a competition between different other, uh, other different types of genocide, when people say, my genocide is better than yours. The third has to do with teaching and morality. And I, I, I have to admit that I've, uh, that was what I found particularly disturbing about that task force. And of course, you find it in American education a great deal, and the laws about that you have to teach the Holocaust in various states. The idea is that if you teach the Holocaust, you're teaching morality. That is, you teach people how to behave well by telling them how people were murdered, which is an extraordinary assumption that doesn't seem to be normally questioned. Why teaching genocide teaches you to be a good person? Why would it not teach you the opposite? Because as we know, usually, in most cases, perpetrators of genocide get away with murder, unlike individuals. That's, it's, whether it's Turkey or whether it's most German perpetrators, people get away with it. It's only if you do it personally to your neighbor, not during genocide, but just in, in times of peace, that you might actually end up in prison. So th that notion of teaching morality has struck me. Now, let me just take two more minutes to just relate to a, a number of historical issues that you mentioned that I'm, I may have misunderstood, but, 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 but I just want to make sure. One has to do with the historical Stolt. My understanding of the, of the German historian's debate of the mid-80s is that although Nolte and Hilgruber and that group were discredited at the time, what they said, and particularly Nolte, ended up being on the winning side. Because the end is that the debate now is a debate of comparative genocide, and particularly between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And that, again, is the new new. This is what people do now. So not at the time, mid-'80s, there was a debate and all that, but he actually won out. What we think about it is another question. The second is about the, the Wehrmacht Ausstellung, the, the Wehrmacht uh, exhibition. And what was so interesting there, and it was interesting at least in Germany as much as in Austria, was the case that for Germans, the case of speaking about the German army as having been involved in mass crimes was much more difficult than to talk about Germans being involved in the, in, in the Holocaust. And the reason was that for most Germans, they didn't have any known relatives who were perpetrators of the Holocaust because they were supposed to be these SS men. How many people had SS and Gestapo uh, relatives, uncles, parents, and so forth? But everyone had a soldier because there were over 20 million soldiers in, in the armed forces. And that was not only unacceptable, but not accepted. That is that, in fact, what happened with the Wehrmacht's Ausstellung was that in, in, in 1999, it was closed down. And when it was redone, it was done in a way that didn't really blame anyone anymore. It became a kind of historical, but what you were saying about it's sort of thing that nobody read and nobody went to, like what we do. Uh, it stopped being a public exhibit. And I'm, I'm curious about how, how does my proposed view of, of that direction fit into yours? Because to me, it seems that there is, there is, there's a different way of how that has evolved. My own sense is that the impatience with the notion that the Holocaust has become, and, and you're right here, has become a sort of measuring rod, has, have, has become the thing that we feel guilty about, that we relate to, that we apologize for, that we build monuments for, has created a very strong um, backlash within the public, within politics, and within academe. And that, that is what is happening right now. Is it? Yeah. Uh, well, that's my. That's what I'm saying. Could I ask this very? Uh, I think. Okay. I'll take you a couple collect. more comments. Uh, but if you just, just take my, notes okay. because we're we're coming close to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. um, so I have uh, Elazar, Derek, and then uh, at the end, Simon. 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 Right. I can't see that far. Simon. We'll we'll call that uh, the end of the comments, and then we'll let Ivan have the have the last word. Elazar. So perhaps in. Uh, just a very short comment. You described this uh, growing European identity, and a, but through a national manifestations of the national guild rather than the European guild. And I was wondering whether you want to explicate a little more about the self-awareness 
of the national guild as part of a European phenomena rather than as more of a localized manifestation of a wider comparative perspective. Uh, there. And just as a comparative comparison situation, I, th I think it's fascinating when human rights are defined through their negation. And in your case, uh, defined through the negation during the war and then questions about the moral choices looks like primarily bystanders. I don't know if you're familiar with the debate over the Human Rights Museum now being built in Canada, where it's something very similar, except that sort of like the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, it's really designed to teach about the Holocaust. Uh, but then it's shrouded in this language of human rights. Uh, but what it became is, and, you're, and in this case not about bystanders, and not about perpetrators, because a Canadian society hates conflict. And if you deal with uh, perpetrators and bystanders, you might have conflicted narrative. It's only about victims. So what happens is it's going to become a parade ground for each of the various victimized groups, primarily Jews and Ukrainians, to, to display their wounds. Uh, and then as people go from room to room, evidently what they're going to have in the final um, uh, room in this, in this museum is a large reproduction of the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. But this is full of logical inconsistencies. But I just thought it might make an interesting. In some ways, it's similar to what you were talking about. In some ways, it's, it's quite different. Uh, you show where it can lead to. One, one more. Yeah. One more. Okay. Simon? Yeah, I'm coming back to this issue about um, singularity and connectedness. I'm a little bit worried about sort of uh, an overwhelming of the, of the discussion by the idea of uh, relative comparis comparisons. Um, I wonder if there's not a space for uh, acknowledgement of both singularity and connectedness, but I think it's very difficult. But one model that one might look at is uh, the way we think about the distinctiveness of human beings. Um, one might think that, uh, speaking very crudely, uh, if you're looking at sheep, for example, then uh, each one is replaceable by every other one in a certain extent. But the, the, the tradition, uh, this is speaking cut in cartoon, but um, <laughs> the, the ways in which we've come to think about human beings is that uh, what's common to each of them is that each one is the only one, so that they're all radically unreplaceable. So you have, uh, as it were, our commonality being a dimension of uh, a singularity. And th this will mean that comparisons between us always open up a wound of injustice, but injustice in a space where what we're desiring is a certain kind of equality, and that's itself a certain kind of justice. So uh, something like singularity can't foreclose the possibility of comparison and of talking about something in the order of an example, but we mustn't think of that moment of comparison as undermining every dimension of singularity, but it could be, in fact, in the name of it. Okay. So thank you very much. I can only answer a few questions, but some were convinced. Uh, the one uh, uh, about um, uh, uh, that you raised uh, about the historical streit of my father and the backlash. Um, the point is that um, all the, the argument uh, to look at uh, to look at the crimes of a communist uh, of, a, of a red army, uh, we have just to take into account that all these arguments have a very long history in in the post-war discussions. So, to uh, to point out in in these specific situations in 1986, one year after uh, Richard von Weizsäcker has for the first time said the 8th of May is a day of liberation for Germany for the Germans. It wasn't only, so to say, very surprising and uh, European-wide uh, acknowledged uh, declaration. It was also, and it's also a very interesting point, a kind of uh, semantic um, a taking over of a communist uh, way of dealing with the past, because it was the turn of a German Democratic Republic to speak about the 8th of May's liberation. So it is a very complex situation. And I, I agree that, uh, it is, uh, that some of his uh, arguments have now turned to, into a different way. But to say it at this specific moment, and f especially to say uh, that brings up all this, so to say, uh, history of terms of uh, always uh, uh, putting the crimes of a uh, uh, Red Army against the Holocaust. This is balancing and, uh, uh, of, of a post-war years to say, no, we are not so guilty because the others also did uh, these crimes. And what he said was that the Holocaust was the reaction to the, so to say, Asiatic 
barbarianism of um, uh, uh, the, Sovi uh, the Soviets, that means it has nothing to do with our modern Western uh, uh, society. And that was the point where everything crashed, so to say. Uh, the second thing, and that really, I think that's very interesting, um, is the question of a backlash. Uh, and we have, I think, distinguished between the academic field, where we have all this, this competition, not only among scholars, but also the competition for defining the new. So if something gets boring academically, you have to find something new. And for example, Bloodland, uh, uh, the, the success of Timothy Snyder can only be explained with this looking for something new. And it was, uh, it's criticized of different reasons, but it is extremely successful and influential, even by people who do not know anything. Just to explain, uh, or to give an example, I was in Copenhagen and there was a, a very uh, weird uh, exhibition about uh, uh, the history of whole mankind. And you could see a room, uh, the, the bloodlands were, and the book lay there, and it was called Bloodlands, and you saw, um, uh, the the uh, uh, what uh, the army of a, of a concentration camp prisoner. It was completely so to say put everything with everything together. But uh, this is academic field that I told you. In the field of remembrance, I'm not so sure what will happen in the future. But if we look now at Europe, I, I don't know. I think at least four, three, and uh, three new. Um, uh, huge uh, memorial museums are open only this year. In Drancy, in Mechelen, where it is combined with a human rights museum, I'm very interested in how they solve this issue. And in Comte uh, uh, in the south of French, it is combined uh, the Holocaust uh, with genocide, and where you can uh, find something about Rwanda and Srebrenica uh, and so on, and Darfur, but nothing about uh, the war in Algeria. So to speak about the genocide is a problem, not to speak about what was your history. And uh, it is to go to these historic sites is in Europe has extremely increased. I think uh, Auschwitz has nearly one million visitors, Mauthausen has 200,000. They have really a topography of very, so to say, popular uh, memorial museums, memorial sites, all over Europe, uh, but uh, uh, and why do societies um, sort of say invest such an amount of resources of that money, of course, in such sites? Because the, uh, there is the idea, or the, uh, there is uh, sort of say the the hope um, that just to visit a memorial place like this, a place like this, will change you from a sort of say renitent youth person to a responsible uh, citizen. Uh, that's what the minister in Austria really said. It is a kind of immunization against uh, right-wing radicalism. And this is, so to say, the difference between the field of action uh, of uh, activities in the memory and, and, the, the, um, uh, uh, and, and the research. And last question, the question of European, Europeanization. Um, Yes and no. On the one hand, as I said, it has to be national, otherwise it was not, would not be this kind of, uh, so to say, what this battle for, history, for memory is for, yes? You have to success on the, on the national level, you have to write the new textbooks, you have to be responsible for the new exhibitions. And the, the sort of say, value of this battle can only be defined nationally. But it is always connected uh, to the European, the new European way of dealing with the past. For example, when Austrian Chancellor Vronitsky uh, held his famous speech in 1991 on the co-responsibility of the uh, Austrian population, he said, because we want to become part of the European Union. And if you look who now wants to become or has become in the last year, member of the ITF, the Baltic states, Serbia, for example, and Dodicha put it in the right way. Uh, to uh, remember the Holocaust has become the entrepillier to the European Union, and that's a fact. What they are telling us in the ITF is, uh, by the way, something completely different from what we're doing at home. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.